All right, we're going to give you just a couple more minutes for those remaining users to uh, join the webinar, and then we'll get started. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Greg Bedlick. I'm an application specialist here at Solid Experts. And uh, I would encourage you to use the chat box in case at any point you lose audio, or uh, if you think my screen is frozen or anything like that, I wanna make sure I give you guys the best experience. So again, use the chat box if you wanna talk to me, and at the end, we can have a, a session for questions if you'd like. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about SolidWorks design for additive manufacturing. Uh, this is using SolidWorks to make designs for 3D printing. Um, there are many different techniques for different styles of 3D printing. Today, we'll be primarily focusing on FDM, or fused deposition modeling. Uh, it's also known as more commonly as triple F, uh, fused filament fabrication. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and um, we'll kind of look at some of the design constraints and different things that you can use for these printers. And what I'd like ideally from this presentation is that uh, if you need to optimize your designs for 3D printing and you are a SOLIDWORKS user, that you can do so with these tools. So going to our next slide, topics. This is what we're gonna cover for it. Uh, 3D printing design constraints. Everyone has a different 3D printer. There's many different manufacturers out there. In order to properly design something for the application, you need to design or you need to know your constraints. Uh, so we'll talk about the limitations of certain printers and just knowing what's gonna help you. Uh, we'll also talk about reducing mechanical support or even dissolvable support. Uh, that's material and time that isn't really necessary. And if you can cut down on it, you're going to have quicker, stronger parts with less material and less time involved. Uh, we'll do part thickness analysis. So this is one of the tools in SOLIDWORKS where you can analyze the minimum and maximum thickness of your parts and identify how to optimize the wall thickness of your prints. There's also SOLIDWORKS Print 3D. This is not so much an add-in as a tool that was introduced in 2013. However, notice I put in 2015, that's when the real enhancements come around. This is where I think it really makes a difference for anyone who's using 2015 and up to see the benefits of Print 3D and um, the tools that SOLIDWORKS has included to optimize your 3D printing experience. And the last, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but we'll talk about just a couple of those methods. It's embedding fasteners, and that's using the pause function, which is fairly common on a lot of industrial printers, and using post-processing to insert those remaining components. So going to the next slide, knowing your limits. Um, this is basically knowing the limits of your printer. Even if you have different printers in your facility, know each one well so that you know how to design for it. The first thing is that when you're printing an overhang, there's generally a support mechanism there to make sure that it can be supported and the print is successful. But if you're using some of the default settings that most 3D printers have, they standardize in a certain angle and then if anything exceeds that threshold, it is supported. However, a lot of printers can actually handle angles quite well. And if you don't need the support, why have it? That's reduced material, that's reduced time. So one of the best ways to do this, we've done this on our printers at our office as well, is that you can print an open source overhang test. Uh, you can find these on many of the 3D content sites available online. So everything from 3D Content Central, Thingiverse, My Mini Factory, Yegi, I mean, there's so many different sites with STL files available. 
but you want to find one of those open source overhang tests. Or if you'd like to, model your own and then contribute to the community and, and make one as well. Um, but go ahead and print one of these open source overhang tests and find out at what point your print starts to fail. You may want to supervise this, but by doing so, you can find out where the printer can handle aggressive angles and where it cannot. So for an example, in our office, we have a Mark Forge Mark II or a Mark Forge reseller, and our Mark II can go upwards of 60 to 65 degrees before we start to see some print failure, things start to string and fall apart. So with that knowledge, Typically, I, I believe Mark Forge tends to enable the automated support around 45 degrees. So if we can print things that are 60 degrees and get away with it without using support, then we toggle that option off and we save a bunch of time and resources. So knowing that number is going to help you because there's times you're going to print circles or overhangs or brackets, and these programs are going to automatically add support and maybe you don't need it. I'll go off, you know, check it out. The next thing is knowing your nozzle size. It is pretty standard on most 3D printers today to have a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, and this is standard. That being said though, you may run into printers where there are options for other sizes. They can be as small as 0.1 or even 0.25 millimeters. That's a little less common, and they can be big as 0.8 and one millimeter. Okay, so these are very large nozzles depositing a very large amount of material or very minimal amount of material. So by knowing 0.4 millimeter, we at least know that when the pathic material comes out of your nozzle, we know the width. And then through your parameters of your 3D printer, we also know the height. By knowing these things, we can kind of increment them in increments of 0.4 or increments of whatever the nozzle is. That way that we're having smooth, flush walls without gaps in between them. Um, so here's just an example. I believe these are from probably an Ultimaker printer. So notice there's a 0 0.25, 0 0.4, uh, 0.6 and a 0.8. So examples of nozzle sizes available. So again, if you know the size, this will help you. And I'll, I'll show you some, some ways to optimize that for you. Uh, so for this example, for this exercise in, in this webinar, uh, we have one of the parts from our SOLIDWORKS Essentials training course. Uh, we offer a four-day training course where you can go through the essentials of SOLIDWORKS. We teach you all about the program from A to Z uh, and even some additional content as needed. And what we have here is just kind of a machined warm gearbox. Could be a CNC machine, could be welded certain places. But if I was going to 3D print this, there are some optimizations that I want to make to it. Okay. The first thing is, is our support. So going into a little more detail with our support, regardless of the type, if you have a Stratasys printer with a dissolvable uh, filament, that works. And if anything, you can actually make some pretty aggressive angles and you can then dissolve that material away. But again, that is time and that is resources. The next thing is, I'm just gonna make sure I'm also, oh, interesting. Yeah, so let's check out my chat button. No one seemed to have chatted me, but it says my screen is paused and it makes me wonder if I've been chatting this entire time and not showing you guys any images. So that being said, what I'd like to do is go ahead and show my screen and just bump up a couple pages backwards so that you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about. Let's go ahead real quick to the back, to the front. I'm gonna go ahead and show my screen again. I do apologize for that. So let's just make sure that my screen is being shown. And I believe it is showing. Just wanna double check this. Okay, good. All right, and then we'll go ahead and present. So again, if I was presenting, excellent. Otherwise, I do apologize, but Here's the content that I was talking about before. Again, knowing your overhang and nozzle size. So we do have the 0 0.25, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 0.8, and going up to your um, your overhang is angles as well. Uh, again, here's the machine of warm gearbox I was talking about. So we have the uh, the overhangs and different aspects of this design that would generally require a lot of support. And then going on to that tab I was just here a moment ago and making sure that I was truly presenting is, again, if you have a Stratasys printer and you have dissolvable support, something like a PVA or a water dissolved support, if you can reduce it and not use it, then you're going to have a better experience. So regardless of type, reducing will support will reduce print time and material usage. You should also reorient your part for minimal support. This is difficult sometimes because you may orient a part for minimal support but then the part isn't as strong as it could be. Given the orientation, the Z layers, and everything else about the print, 
do you use the support and have a strong part, or do you alter the print for a faster print time, but potentially a weaker structure? And again, you will have to find the balance of that between time, money, and the application used. Um, optimizing your overhangs with support-free angles. So as I had mentioned, the Mark II in our office that has, and even the Mark II and the X7, both those printers, both can cool their parts and properly print at upwards of 60 to 65 degrees. So by knowing that, if I can take faces that are generally aggressive 90 degrees, and if I can create a slight slope on them to be 60 degrees, then we're gonna have a much better experience. So here's an example, these kind of, um, these large extrusions, these circular extrusions on the side for the worm gearbox where a shaft would enter, these are large cylindrical extrusions. Um, if I can make a long sloping face on these, I'm going to have a much better experience. Um, again, just to kind of toggle these on, toggle them off. We're using a lofted feature to make a long sweeping face on this part. Okay, so we can enable that. Um, reducing support. So I'm going to go ahead and just pause this and enable some of that other text. There we go. So I've made a quick little video just kind of showing you which features in here can be optimized with that angle to reduce your support material. So again, just kind of wandering around highlighting these different faces that are impacted. Okay, so bottom faces right there, cylindrical extrusions on the side, extrusions on the front. Um, so managing this, you definitely want to use configurations. Uh, no one should make a modification to their part and then be stuck with it. You want to use configurations inside of SOLIDWORKS to make sure that you have versions that are altered for maybe 3D printing or additive, and then other ones that are meant for the original part, which was machining. Uh, again, you can use chamfers, lofts, or drafts to apply these angles, and you want to make sure you use the appropriate angle. So that's kind of a good example right there. I'm going to drag that back and just kind of pause it a little bit. Right there, this face was originally uh, horizontal and there was nothing really underneath there and support would have been generated, it would have rested on that face and that would have been excess material. But by creating a 45 to 50 degree draft here or a chamfer, this allows for uh, support to not be generated and now we have a smooth face that print can be printed. Um, so I'll go ahead and resume the rest of that print, but that's kind of looking around just some of the optimizing of the features uh, on this, so modifying your support. Go ahead, so again, 45, 60. We have had other printers in the office um, where as soon as it hit 45, the prints are to fail. It, it could not deposit material at an excess of 45 degrees and it started to fail. So that being said, the support mechanism put in place by the manufacturer was at 45 and that's fair, we'll let it go. And, and now we know that if we were to exceed it, we really do need support. Otherwise, if your printer is a little bit better than you really think and it can handle a higher angle, go ahead and take it. I had mentioned earlier about the size of the nozzle. So 0.4 millimeters or 0.25 or 0.6. Again, 0.4 is pretty standard, but again, other machines can handle different sizes. Um, in SOLIDWORKS, and I'll show a video for this, there's something called a thickness analysis. So underneath the evaluate tab. And what this allows for you to do is check for the thickness of walls. So on the left, I have an example of a one millimeter thick wall. In order to accommodate that, it would be a 0.4 millimeter wall pass, followed by a 0.2 millimeter, followed by a 0.4 millimeter. And that 0.2 in the middle can't really be done with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. So it just skips it, it's gap. So we kind of call this hollow wall where you can look at a print, you look at the very top of it and you're gonna see these gaps and spaces between very thin features. And that's because most 3D printers can't correctly map that space and are doing in increments of 0.4 millimeters. The other thing is, is what's your minimum thickness that your printer can support? So does the manufacturer support something that is smaller than one millimeter or do they have a number? Mark Forge, for example, they standardize on a minimum wall thickness of 1.6. Doesn't mean that you can't go under it, but as a supported manufacturer, they're really asking you don't make things less than 1.6 millimeters. This also happens to be four wall passes or four layers, so four millimeters or 0.4 millimeters. So if you can increase the increments in the nozzle size and also go with the manufacturer suggested wall thickness, you're gonna have a better experience. So instead of just telling you about the feature, let's show you the feature. I have another video right here. I'm gonna go ahead and play this one. Notice on the top left in the evaluate menu, we have something called the thickness analysis. I'm gonna go ahead and pause this. So thickness analysis on the top, I can show thin or thick regions. 
I'm going to go ahead and type in 1.6 millimeters. That is the minimum thickness I'm looking for. So I'm asking SolidWorks, hey, tell me anything that's thinner than this, because this is going to cause problems with my print. So I'm going to go ahead and press play on this one. Type in 1.6. It's going to do a quick calculation. Depending on the complexity of the model, this could take a longer, could take a little bit shorter. In this case, I wouldn't say this is a complex model, but if it does have to go through and I analyze each face, it could take some time. Now notice that you can modify the colors. Here I like some pretty blatant aggressive colors that show me what's wrong, what's right. And I'm gonna go ahead and pause this again. Notice that there's a little red lip around the perimeter. And if you hover over it, it shows you the wall thickness. So I can see on that fillet, it's about 0.96, and a lot of trailing numbers, uh, millimeters. That is under the 1.6 that is desired. So everything else in here is appropriate, but this red face is not correct. So I'm gonna go ahead and resume this. And how do we modify it? Well, we'd go back to the feature and we'd modify the thickness. So select my sketch on the feature, modify it from one to 1 1.6, 1.6 millimeters. Go ahead and do a rebuild. We'll exit the sketch. And then we're all set. That's 1.6 millimeters and is approved for the manufacturer's uh, recommendations and will avoid those hollow walls. Um, file print 3D. So this is something that I don't think anyone ever sees and that's because it's in the file menu. The only reason we go to the file menu is to save as, to pack and go or to open. But there is actually a really nice tool down here. It's called print 3D. And what it allows you to do, and again, I'll show you a video of this as well, is that basically you can mock up your part in a printer, how it's going to react all within SOLIDWORKS. It's not as good as maybe going into the real slicer of the printer, but this gives you a little bit of an idea of what you're going to expect before you leave SOLIDWORKS and go into your other program. So for settings, you can select a printer from a list of available printers. SOLIDWORKS has actually grown a very large list of printers that can be used. Um, so these are a lot of different brands and manufacturers. Uh, you can orient and scale your model, so you can see the kind of volume and orientation that's necessary. And then if you do have a compatible 3D printer, you can generate the files for printing and modify, uh, modify the infill percentage, density, supports, and rafts. Um, what I like is the preview, so I can see which faces are going to require support. Um, and I can also see kind of the layer height. So if I have a very minimal layer, I can see how smooth the domed faces may be, versus if I have a very thick layer height, I can see those striations, that layering, the stepping on domed faces. So again, we'll grab a video and I'll show that to you. Go ahead and press play. So this is what I was mentioning. We don't really go to file often unless we're going to open, save, or pack and go something. But notice right below where it says print, like your standard paper printing, we have the option to print 3D. When you select print 3D, I've already gone in and kind of selected an option for this, but again, we have a Mark Forge Mark II. And looking down this list, there's actually quite a lot of different things. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of brands here that I'm familiar with. Uh, I, I see actually mono prices in the middle. I believe they're actually a, kind of like General Electric. They're a manufacturer of a lot of different items. And one of those is a consumer grade 3D printer. Um, so there's a lot of different cool brands in here. And again, it's, it's really enhanced at least in 2020 for the, uh, the, the number of brands and manufacturers available. I'm gonna go ahead and resume this. Notice that you can choose the face of where the print would exist, right? So I've chosen the bottom face of this part. However, the orientation doesn't fit in the bed. What's nice is, so I've chosen the manufacturer. It's taken the Mark II's build plate size. It's basically uh, put that inside of SOLIDWORKS for visualization and we can orient the part on this properly. So while it does fit, it does need to be reoriented. Uh, thankfully, they have a button here that says orient to fit, which rotates it by 90 degrees and puts in the volume. You can also scale to fit as well if necessary. And then you can go ahead and identify faces for support with color and also turn on the striations or layer lines so it's easier for visibility. You do have to set the uh, suggested support angle. They do not have these from the manufacturers. So in this case, on the top left, I'm typing in the number 60 degrees. So I'm looking for anything that would fail on our 3D printer. Um, 
So I'm going to go ahead and resume this. I've chosen a layer height of 200 microns or 0.2 millimeters. And notice that now that I've enabled this, these blue faces indicate what needs support. So this is kind of cool that I can see what the printer thinks need support before I go to the printer or go to the slicer software. So, I mean, these were pretty obvious, which was going to require it, but at least on the circles, getting to see what part of the circle really exceeds the 60 degrees is nice. So we'll go ahead and resume this. We can see all the faces that are potentially questionable. I'm going to say, okay, and let's go ahead and get the appropriate configuration. So here is my secondary configuration. This is the optimized one where I've taken all of the faces that were overhangs of 90 degrees and I've applied a draft angle of anywhere between 45 and 60 degrees to these faces. And again, we're gonna do the same steps as last time. Bring it in, select the bottom face, orient to fit. We're gonna go ahead and resume. Again, I'll type in those same settings. So, well, I did start that over a little bit again. I apologize. Let's go ahead, there we go. So we're gonna go ahead and preview that, use the 60 degrees, and look at this, there's a whole lot less blue. Those vertical faces, so the bottom of this rectangular extrusion, uh, these circular extrusions on the side, those no longer have blue on them. So you will have to evaluate the material that you use to do this if that defeats the point of support. Generally it does, by adding a small chamfer or draft to a part, you are going to save material on support. But again, I wouldn't go crazy trying to create support in places that ultimately uh, could be solved with a chamfer or vice versa. Um, so we'll go ahead and resume this and we can see some of these faces are, are no longer uh, requiring support. Keep going through the video here. And there we go. So it looks good. So the next thing we want to talk about is embedded fasteners. And there's a lot of different solutions for this. And I'd just like to show you a couple of the methods that are ideal for this application. Um, again, there's probably a dozen, maybe two dozen different ways to put in different fasteners, but I'd like to show you a couple of ones that I'm familiar with and really do enjoy using. Um, so replacing tapped holes or plastic threads with standard hardware. And when we think of embedded nuts, right? So we're thinking of putting a captive nut or a nut that would go into your part and stay there permanently or could be replaced later on. So the two ways we can do this is we could use the pause function on your printer, or we could drop it in. And when I say embedded nuts, I mean standard hardware nuts. These are things like six hexagonal sides. This is, this is something you can go to the hardware store or you can uh, buy uh, online as, as needed. Um, the other option, which is maybe slightly more professional and more customer friendly and sleeker looking, would be a threaded heat insert. Um, so this is using a threaded heat insert, using a soldering iron or something like that to gently depress this into the surface and use this for a subtle threaded application. Uh, so here's an item or a, or a picture of it. So again, here's a couple different methods. I'm gonna show you four different methods. So embedded nuts with the print pots. Um, what you could do here is you could use method one, which is um, use the pause function. So again, MarkForge has this. We're really, if you can't tell, we're really familiar with our MarkForge printers. We are working on other brands such as Formlabs and Rise, but most printers, and I mean most of them, and even if they don't have it when you purchased it, I would check on it again because firmware is a wonderful thing. And it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of manufacturers have made upgrades, but you should have the ability to pause your print at a certain layer height. So by doing so, you can get a notification or your print can be paused. And when that pauses, you can go in and make modifications to your part. Again, Mark Forge, you had the ability to take out your build plate, do things to the part and put it back in without any loss of tolerances. And what I mean in this case is basically um, pause at a layer height and put in your hardware. So again, you wanna use the pause function. Um, the example, what I'm kind of showing here and I'm kind of going back and forth from slides is that again, the pause function can be at a certain layer height for where the embedded hardware goes. So on the right, I guess the names could be interchanged, but I call it cavity nut and bow tie. And what we mean by that is, I've got a couple little arrows right here, is that on your pause layer, so this is this blue face right here, you can make a small hexagon channel 
and you want it to be pointing up. So when you think about hexagon nut, there's your flats going up or your point going up. You wanna have the point going up, make a channel that represents the same shape as it, and you want to drop in that nut and then print something that I call the bow tie. And the bow tie basically represents the top surface of the hexagon nut. It makes it flush to the rest of the part. Now, why would I use the bow tie? Why do I have it there? Well, when you're resuming prints and when you're pausing prints, the thermoplastic, the filament, generally adheres well to itself and other objects, even if you're using a little bit of adhesive. But if you're using something like a large smooth magnet or an RFID chip or an LED, whatever it may be, sometimes the thermoplastic doesn't adhere as well as it could, which is why I always like to make sure it is sticking to an object that isn't necessarily foreign. So anytime I'm putting embedded hardware in these prints, I'm always using a spacer or a bow tie or something that is a familiar material that the thermoplastic can adhere to. So the bow tie will be one, a familiar material to adhere to, and two, it'll be a filler. It'll allow for the hexagon nut to stay exactly where it is without rotating, okay? The next example, so, so this one is a little bit more permanent, right? Because when you start doing the pause and resume, and once your print is complete, this is embedded deep into your part. It's hidden, no one really knows it there. They just see kind of a threaded hole and it works. The next application is maybe you wanna have a nut, but you wanna be able to take it out, okay? So I call this just the drop-in nut. And what this is, is that you create a very similar channel to what we had before, but this time the channel goes all the way out to the exterior of the part. And this allows for you to drop the nut into the channel. So when you're done your print, when you're done it, you wanna make sure you have that channel nice and available. If you have support in it, that's okay. You can take it out if necessary. And if you don't need it, don't use support. But what that allows us to do is drop a nut vertically into that spot and then use a fastener or a bolt or anything like that to secure it in place. Um, so this is a nice solution where you can remove things as needed. Um, I'm a big fan of this because for me, this is the least amount of work. I go into SolidWorks, I create a small hexagon channel with a hole. And then depending on the orientation of the part, I print it and later on I go to the hardware store, I pick up some appropriate sized nuts, I drop them in there, put my fastener in, and it's a very quick, easy, cheap solution. Again, if it needs to be customer facing, you might wanna choose a sleeker option. The last method is your threaded heat inserts. So you can buy these online. Um, you probably won't find them a lot of your general stores. Um, the plastic threaded heat inserts, there are many heat inserts meant for general plastics, ABS or injection molded parts, but becoming more and more common are these heated inserts for 3D prints. And again, McMaster has them. There's a lot of other uh, online retailers that sell them and it's just variations. It's your size, your method for grabbing onto the filament. Uh, but again, definitely look around online and see what kind of things you can find. Um, I would love to give you some recommendations on dimensions and wall thickness and things like that, but that is very much up to the manufacturer and everyone will have some different requirement for their uh, heated inserts. All I can say is follow those, in those instructions. Um, don't model your part, print it, and then go get the heat inserts. You definitely want to research your heat inserts first, find the appropriate dimensioning and spot for it, and then take it from there. So an example is, is that, again, you can use a hot soldering iron. Uh, they do sell the tips. They sell soldering irons for this. There's all different ways to do it, but as long as you have something that is hot, conductive, applying heat to that heat insert, and you are gently depressing it into that space and allowing room for that material to go somewhere, usually with a channel a bit deeper, um, you can embed these in there. And if done correctly, they can be permanent. They can be a very good uh, setup. Um, we have used press inserts. I don't necessarily recommend press inserts because while those are a good solution and you can implement them fairly quick with an arbor press, uh, you do, uh, after a while, if you're really using them and torquing them and using them frequently for fasteners, you'll note that they will come a little bit loose, which is why I start to favor towards the threaded heat inserts because those physically melt the material around it and have a better uh, seating. So again, you can use both options, but if I had to choose an option that was a little bit more permanent, I would definitely go with the threaded heat inserts. 
again, this is post-processing. So after your part is done, it's very simple. It doesn't matter what face you're doing this to, as long as you have access to it and you can use something hot to put those in there, uh, it, it's a good solution. So um, if you wanna go the nut route, you absolutely can. That's slightly hidden, um, but you can also have some removable options and you can use the threaded heat inserts. Um, so reviewing some topics and what we have here. Um, well, so completed results. This is kind of looking at our part here. What changes have we made to it? Uh, well, we've gone ahead and looked at design constraints. We've figured out what our printer has for those design constraints. For us, it's a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, and we know that angles cannot exceed 60 degrees without needing support. Um, so taking this design that would generally need support, um, we've at least reduced it. I'm not saying this is a support-free model. We know that the circular faces on the inside may still need it. We know the rectangular opening on the front absolutely needs it, but we've at least reduced the support necessary on the circular extrusions on the side, the front, and the back. Okay, so reducing support is really gonna help you out. Um, I would definitely try this. Just go to one of your printers. You might wanna supervise it just when you know it's getting towards one of those critical points. Um, and I just, I say supervise it because you don't want to print falling over and then just drag it around for the next two hours. Um, I just say supervise it once you get towards one of those points that you can pause to print and, and know where it's going to fail. But optimizing and knowing, and knowing those angles is, is really key. Um, we also use the part thickness analysis tool. So again, finding different features on your part that may be too thin. Uh, in this case, we had a small retaining lip on the very top of this part that was one millimeter. That's not necessarily wrong, but it is below the supported thickness by the manufacturer. We needed to identify it, so we used the part thickness analysis tool. We saw that it was underneath our suggested limit, which we typed in as 1.6 millimeters, and it showed us with a color indicating that it was under the required uh, thickness. So we can modify it and use it. And we also made sure that it was uh, an increments of our nozzle size. So 0.4 millimeters multiplied by four is, is 1.6 millimeters. Uh, we also talked about SOLIDWORKS Print 3D. Uh, Print 3D is, again, it's not really an add-in. It's a tool built into SOLIDWORKS. And it was, uh, or at least the intended purpose of it is to mesh well with your 3D printers. Uh, in a perfect scenario, you want to use that tool to go straight from SOLIDWORKS to your 3D printer. But I do realize that uh, a lot of manufacturers don't work as well as they could with the Windows 8.1 driver. So I, I, I do fear that we still have to go to our slicers to really hone in the settings, the layer height and everything else we need. Um, but if you do have a printer that is compatible, then I would definitely urge you to use SOLIDWORKS to create those files so that it's one less um, software, one, one, less, one less thing to use. Uh, but really what I use the SOLIDWORKS Print 3D and why I like having it in SOLIDWORKS is that I can analyze how the part is going to look and how it's going to behave. So what faces are going to require support? How can I minimize and check them before going to my slicing software? How can I see how the striations are going to look? You know, if I'm printing someone's nice domed smooth cover for something and I'm using 200 layer uh, height, Am I going to have a lot of stepping on this part? And is it going to be very noticeable that it's 3D printed? And if I change the orientation, will that stepping go down? Um, and if I change the orientation, how's my support going to be? Uh, so Print 3D is a really good tool. And, and um, I would definitely encourage you just to experiment and throw in one of those parts and, and see how it will go. Um, the last thing is embedding fasteners. And uh, again, this can be embedded hardware such as nuts or bolts. There are ways to include bolts, um, but for now I think nuts is a good method and you can either use pause functions inside of your printer to insert nuts, uh, RFID chips, magnets, LEDs, um, whatever application you're thinking of, even I guess cabling if there's an application for a connector, right? Um, so definitely use that uh, function if you can. You can also again use kind of a captive nut style where placing your hexagon nut in a small crevice that is shaped in a hexagon to lock in that shape or create a channel where you can drop it in and, and fasten it from there. Um, and then post-processing. So going in and uh, cleaning out those holes if necessary, and, and if not, including your 
uh, threaded heat inserts and pressing those in there as needed. Um, so let's see, do we have anything else here? Nope, that's going to be the last of it. So that concludes what we have for now, Solrix Design for Additive Manufacturing. Um, if you have any questions, again, this is for generally FDM 3D printing, okay, so fused deposition modeling. Um, the Montreal division has recently uh, become a reseller of Form Labs, so our SLA printers. Uh, this is an entirely different line and style of printers, allowing to make very, very detailed prints with a kind of photopolymer UV sensitive resin. So there will be an entirely different set of design constraints based around SLA. So I would definitely keep an eye out for maybe some documentation or webinars from a March and division regarding how to best design your parts in SLA. Um, and again, some of these methods could also be involved towards uh, the metal printing as, as well. So the Mark Forge Metal X. Uh, but if you do have any questions, I would encourage you to go ahead and use the chat box or question box and go to webinar. And uh, otherwise, everybody's staying happy and healthy and we'll take it from there. So I'll hang out for a couple of minutes, ask questions if needed. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and end the, uh, the webinar. I appreciate you guys using the question box earlier when I was having problems with uh, visibility. I appreciate you guys chatting in there and saying that you could see it. Yep, there we go. Yeah, there's Monica saying you can still see your first slide. Boy, am I glad uh, I caught that and I didn't go the whole webinar just talking about one page. Yep, can see now. Okay, good. Awesome. Yeah, so Adrian says, do you have experience in polymer selection for prints? So when you say polymer selection, are you asking for different selection of filaments for your printing? Because, um, okay, yes, all right. So yeah, it, it depends on what you're printing. Um, so again, I, I always talk about the printers that we sell because we know those best. Um, we use a nylon blend with shredded carbon fiber. So again, depending on what you use for your prints, um, this can all be dependent on impact resistance, um, let's see, Mark Fortune stock is so I'd like a demo. Okay, yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it depends on what you have for materials. Um, the cheapest and most common is PLA, polylactic acid. Um, and this is, it's a cheap hobby grade material and there's nothing wrong with using it, but it definitely starts to fall apart um, with UV exposure and uh, it has a low temperature deflection. So, uh, you know, if you let it sit in your hot summer car for uh, a couple hours, I would definitely expect some warping, drooping, or even melting. Um, so PLA is definitely cheap. Your next one that's very common is using ABS. A lot of Stratasys printers use ABS, um, and a lot of hobbyist grade printers use ABS as well. And again, that is uh, stronger, does have a better heat deflection. It is a little bit more weather resistant and UV resistant. And then from there, I mean, there's a lot of variations such as, um, PETG, uh, there's polycarbonates, there's nylon. Um, there are many, many different options out there. And again, I would definitely pay attention to the uh, the applications of your part. So again, if you do need something that has some elastic qualities to it, maybe something like a TPU or a rubber compound, um, where again, we love nylon at our office. We love nylon because it has a lot of chemical resistance. Um, it does have a little bit of flex, but when paired with carbon fiber, it can be incredibly strong. It has a great matte black appearance. Um, but again, it, it's all depending on your application of the print and, and what you use. Um, there's a lot of good articles online, and maybe we'll have to write up one at some point, which is listing uh, the applications and, and what's best used for it. But I'd say chemical resistance, strength, and, um, and appearance are, are probably a, a lot of the 
uh, highly seeked uh, qualities of your of your print. Yeah, so Adrian says, does carbon fiber infused nylon still retain the chemical resistance? Yeah, so the Mark Forge demos is pretty cool because, um, and, and you'll you'll have to kind of see some videos of this because it's it's best seen in a video. Uh, the nylon, it's a nylon 12, essentially. It's like a nylon 12 with shredded carbon fiber built into it. Um, it is small shredded bits of it. So anywhere between 25, 30, uh, even maybe 40%, it's kind of a secret blend of shredded carbon fiber thrown into a nylon. It's called Onyx and it's matte black, it's beautiful. On top of that, Mark Forge has the ability to add uh, reinforced carbon fiber in strands. So it's technically enclosed. So the nylon by itself has a high chemical resistance. The carbon fiber makes it a little bit stronger with a little bit better heat deflection. And on top of that, it's kind of already surrounding these strands of carbon fiber. So yeah, it absolutely, not only is it strong, but it's still gonna retain that chemical resistance. Um, there is a very good sheet online that basically lists all the chemicals that can resist from uh, different acids to you know house grade oils. Um, and it's a very good list because it shows everything with ratings of A to D. Uh, D basically being it would disintegrate and destroy it, A to zero impact. Um, so there's actually a very good list. Uh, so you wouldn't expect porosity forming in the carbon fiber nylon 12 where the strands were. Um, well, so porosity, the only other thing we can think of is, is that these parts are, again, chemical resistance. They can certainly hold up to, you know, different acids and different applications in machine shops. Um, but we would never say that they're water uh, proof. I would never say, let's go build a, a research submarine or anything like that out of this material. Um, it, it, being nylon, it can absorb upwards of 6% uh, water. So yeah, the, these parts, if you definitely wanna treat them externally to reduce the intake of fluids, that's definitely a must. Otherwise, um, again, they can handle the chemicals, but again, uh, how, huh, what it absorbs and how it absorbs it is, is always dependent on the, on the chemical. Um, so we always say, you know, a, a post-treatment of epoxy or, or some sort of um, uh, water repellent would, would definitely be a must. Um, but those are some good questions. Um, Levon says, does Montreal have form labs and Mark Forge in stock? If so, I would like a demo. Yeah, so Mark Forge uh, has been working very, very hard to make sure that everything is still in stock and has materials. Um, they definitely panicked and, and said, you know, if we're gonna have a pandemic, we need to make sure our customers are well stocked. Uh, so as far as I know, the Montreal division absolutely has those. Um, we have a division in Nashua, which is where I'm based out of Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, we don't stock them locally, but Mark Forge is out of uh, Watertown, uh, Massachusetts. So we're actually fairly close. And as far as I know, they're fulfilling orders and shipping out. The Form Labs is a very new relationship, and I would have to double check on where we stand with that, but I don't see any reason why uh, either company wouldn't be able to, uh, to do that. So um, if you want to, definitely reach out uh, to my email address or... Uh, reach out to solidextras.com. We have a bunch of contact pages put in place. If you want to go ahead and contact those and just ask for additional information or a demo, we can certainly do that. And uh, with everything we've been doing now, we've been doing a lot of demos online and, and even online training for printers. We've set up webcams in front of our printers and showed people how to use them and, and do what they can with those. Um, so, yeah, no, there's, there's definitely some opportunities for it. Um, Okay, awesome. Yeah, so that concludes it. Again, I do apologize for the uh, first couple of minutes of the webinar being uh, just the intro page, but uh, again, thank you for your patience. It looks like we've got plenty of good questions and we've answered those. So um, there's no other questions. I'll let you guys go. And again, everybody stay happy, healthy, and, and safe.